Good evening and welcome to Now You See TV in the Virtual House Church. I'm Darren and this is Zach from My House Ministries. And we're fortunate and blessed enough to have been asked to share tonight's Torah portion with you. Uh, we're in week 10 here, my cats from the end. And let's kick it off. So thanks everybody for uh, joining us this week as always. Uh, we're always uh, blessed to be able to hear from you, to fellowship with you, uh, to discuss uh, to dive into some questions, dive into some awesome topics. And so uh, before we get started, if you have never uh, watched the Virtual House Church before, what the Virtual House Church is, uh, it was started by Rob Skiba uh, back in 2010 or in 2012, 2013 is when he put the Virtual House Church together. Uh, he has some great information on the Virtual House Church page, archived uh, videos from years past, uh, the, all the different Torah portions, as you can see on the left there, some different resources. And then, as always, I like to show this map, the restoration of Israel. Um, if you're looking for fellowship in your area, you can kind of scroll in, uh, put put your uh, spot on the map, and, and find some other people who are in your area to fellowship with you. Um, and as always, you can uh, connect with us on myhouseministries.net. Uh, there's the connect tab where you could, you know, fill out some information. We'd love to hear from you, connect with you, um, join our, uh, our group and our discussions as well. Um, and each week uh, on our blog site, Mike Bauer does a wonderful job putting together the, the weekly portion in the ISR, the scriptures translation. So if you're looking to read along in the ISR, we have that available um, each week uh, as well to read along. So uh, we're, we're super excited this week to, to discuss uh, the continuing the story of, of Joseph in Egypt. And so tonight we've kind of titled this one Rise to Power, and we're going to be talking all about the, uh, the rise to power of Joseph uh, when he is in the land. So tonight is from the end, my cats, as Darren just said. We're going to be reading Genesis 41.1 through 44.17 tonight. Uh, and if you're feeling ambitious, you could dive into the prophets in the New Testament as well. Zechariah 3 through 4, 7, and Luke 24, 13 through 29. So last week we had a little chart. We talked about some of the uh, similarities between uh, Joseph, Yosef, and Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah. And so we uh, put some correlating scriptures in here this week as well. Uh, we'll kind of run down and, and, and discuss those a little bit. Yes, yeah, so what we're going to look at tonight is um, they were both about 30 years old when they started their ministry. Uh, when we're going to see when Joseph is taken out of prison by Pharaoh, he is given a new name. And when our Savior returns, he will have a name on his thigh, which only he knows. Uh, Yosef is, is put at the right hand of Pharaoh over all of Egypt. And obviously our Savior is at the right hand of the throne in heaven. Uh, Yosef warned, his uh, warned the people of Egypt, I should say, of an impending danger. And one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture, Matthew 24 uh, Yeshua warns of what's going to happen to the temple and what's going to happen in the end uh, before he returns. Um, another great point here, um, the people of Jacob, the tribe of or, or the descendants of Jacob, the people of Israel are saved by Yosef in the next passages we're going to read. And obviously Yeshua is the savior for all of his people or all of those in covenant with him, all of Israel. And I think that's a cool connection to make. And we talked a little bit about it last week with, uh, you know, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We're going to see that he's, you know, he's saving uh, Jacob's descendants, Jacob who became Israel. Uh, but he's also probably going to be saving the Egyptians as well through, through this time of the famine um, because they are turning to him and, and seeing the most high through him. Just like with Yeshua, he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but he's saving those uh, who are outside of covenant because they want to enter into covenant when they see the miracles that come through, uh, you know, the, the word made flesh, if you will. It's, it's, so it's kind of awesome to, to see some of these parallels as they, they continue to connect. And I'll take you one further. When Moshe brings the people out in the Exodus, many uh, non-Israelites cling to them and a mixed multitude comes out because they've seen the power of the Most High God. Um, Joseph is unknown to his brothers. They don't recognize him uh, through, through the beginnings of the portion we're going to read tonight. And one of Zach's favorite parts, he always goes to Yeshua after the resurrection on the road to Emmaus is not recognized by his brothers as he's talking to them and sharing with them and revealing himself to them uh, throughout the scripture. Uh, the last thing we're going to talk about tonight is uh, Yosef made provision for his brothers and prepared a strange land, prepared them in a, prepared for them in a strange land. And Yeshua, before the scattering of Judah, finally, he had pre provided his spirit um, 
for the people for provision in a strange land. And again, he talks about that again in Ezekiel chapter 26. And so we will, um, I, I posted on Facebook this graph last week, this chart last week. And I will also post the link for the, for the there's a, a, a chart that we found with a, a ton of different scriptures and correlations on them. Um, I'm going to start posting those as well. We also had somebody reach out um, and he wanted to, to see the, the slides or the PDFs of, of the slides that we use to discuss with his uh, home fellowship. Um, so if anybody else out there is interested, I'm going to start posting uh, the PDFs of, of each week, the, the Torah portion on our Facebook and also on myhouseministries.net in case you, you get together with, with a, a group or a home fellowship or whatever you might do and you want to kind of discuss and, and, and read through these as well with them uh, what we're gonna start making those available and, and we love to hear the the comments the, the, the feedback uh, any you know type of uh, format changes that, that you'd like to see you know week to week uh, we're, we're trying to adjust and, and learn on the fly as, as we do this and so we, we you know we definitely want to connect with all of you and, and make this uh, something that's comfortable and, and something that's you know fun and insightful for everybody as we read through these scriptures so uh, Darren we're, we're we leave off last week what would we discuss last week before we hop into to the portion this week sure last week was very interesting because joseph was given a coat by his father uh, he was placed in high esteem as the favorite son of his father he's actually stripped of his coat thrown into a pit by his brothers they sell him to passing uh, midianites who are passing through on their way to egypt he sold into slavery in egypt we take a, a, a kind of a hiccup or a detour there and we talked about uh, judah and the line of Christ being extended or the line of Yeshua being extended through Judah and Tamar, his, his former daughter-in-law who has Perez and, uh, yeah, super interesting portion Zara. there because it, it's right in the middle of the story of Joseph. So, uh, we're, we're left with a cliffhanger. He's, uh, he's, uh, thrown in the pit. He's sold to the, uh, the Midianites and then goes into into the land of Egypt and then boom all of a sudden we, we switch back to Judah and so we talked about in our group last week it's interesting how we're talking about the lineage of Jacob and it starts with the 11th son it starts with Joseph and then it goes right into Judah um, describe it says uh, the, the portion started off last week this is the the lineage of Jacob and so it's interesting those two sons that were mentioned and, and we're gonna talk I think as, as weeks continue about why those two sons are important and why number one what we're gonna see with uh, the, the mellow Hagoyim that comes from Ephraim through Joseph and how the line that that Darren was just talking about with Yehuda with Judah how that brings about um, our king and priest Messiah Yeshua and so it's very interesting that those two were the ones mentioned in this lineage about Jacob mm -hmm. yeah the two tribes or the two houses of Israel uh, the final chapter that we covered last week had Yosef in prison with the cupbearer and baker of Pharaoh he interprets a dream for them and he tells the cupbearer within three days Pharaoh is going to judge you and he will restore you to your position and he tells the baker within three days Pharaoh is going to judge you and you're gonna hang and that comes true. And then we, the last thing we read was that the cupbearers restored his position with Pharaoh and forgets Joseph or does not bring Joseph up. Yeah, that's the, as the, he promised Joseph he would. And that's one of the things we, we talked about um, with, with the virtual house church last week, as well as with our uh, fellowship, um, that it, he didn't really just forget him, but he kind of intentionally did not want to uh, bring up Joseph's name to the Pharaoh. He kind of stuck it to Joseph. He was back to his esteem and he, you know, deliberately forgot about Joseph. And that's where we kind of leave off and, and where we're going to start this week with Genesis 41. Yeah. So it's two years later. And the interesting thing is the timing of Yahweh is if he would have brought Joseph up prior to him being perplexed by a dream, by Pharaoh being perplexed by a dream, it may have amounted to nothing. Now's the perfect time. There's tension in Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh is trying to figure this all out. And now Joseph comes before him with this great revelation from God. All right. So without further ado, we're going to jump into Genesis 41 and begin tonight's portion. My cats. And it came to be at the end of two years time that Pharaoh had a dream and he saw and saw him standing by the river and saw seven cows coming up out of the river, fine looking and fat, and they fed amongst the reeds. Then saw seven other cows coming up from out of the river, ugly and lean of flesh. And they stood by the other cows on the bank of the river and the ugly and lean of flesh cows ate up the seven fine looking fat cows. Then Pharaoh awoke and he slept and dreamed a second time. And he saw seven heads of grain coming up on one stalk. And he saw seven lean heads scorched by the east wind and coming up after them. 
So we talked uh, last week a lot about how Joseph was this interpreter of dreams. He was able to interpret his own dreams. He was able to interpret the dreams of those with him in the prison. But it does note that he he wasn't the one interpreting the dreams. He knows that he wasn't. It was the Most High interpreting the dreams and giving him the revelation of what those were. So we're going to see how this really comes to play uh, a key factor with Pharaoh's dreams here uh, as well. So real quick, just to talk about this east wind, um, because it talks about the, the, the east wind coming through here. Um, and, and I believe it's going to be the next chapter or the next section here in, in verse 13. So keep an eye out for uh, verse 13 where it's talking about the east wind because it's going to be very interesting how it plays off to these dreams. And the seven lean heads swallowed up the seven plump and complete heads. Then Pharaoh awoke and saw it was a dream. And it came to be in the morning that his spirit was moved and he sent and called for all the magicians of Mitzrayim and all the wise men, and Pharaoh related to them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. And the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my crimes this day, when Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in confinement in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker. Each one of us dreamed a dream in one night, he and I, and each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. So we, we've talked before about some of the references in the book of Jasher. According to the book of Jasher, at this time, all of Pharaoh's wise men and magicians come before him. And what happens is they give him a bunch of different interpretations. There's an interpretation. You're going to have seven daughters or the seven cows, and they're going to die in your lifetime. There's the interpretation. You're going to build seven cities and the Canaanite kings are going to destroy them in your lifetime. Or you're going to appoint seven rulers and they're going to be destroyed by seven princes. And Pharaoh's not buying it. And Jasher account actually says that Pharaoh's at the point where he is going to kill all his wise men. This might be what triggered the cupbearer to realize how serious this situation is now. And a lot of this reminds me, of course, obviously, uh, we, talk, we talked about how our Heavenly Father does everything in cyclical patterns. In the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar wants his dream interpreted, and he's about to kill all his wise men because none of them can bring him a satisfactory answer. And so, you know, we, we always kind of... Uh put quotations around the book of Jasher where we're always kind of cautious when quoting it. I know there's a lot on the fence back and forth whether or not, um, I, I know Rob is a big, big proponent of the book of Jasher. Uh, we have his uh, uh, combined book um, with the extra biblical texts along with Genesis and also Dr. Stephen Pigeon who wrote the, uh, the, the put the F Sefer together, together uh, as a big proponent of the book of Jasher. So there, there's, you know, kind of two camps and, and we're always yeah. cautious when, when talking about it uh, because, you know, you know, uh, of those, of those two camps, but it, Jasher does add a lot of interesting insight, um, and it is referenced in, uh, in, in the Torah, which we're going to hopefully get to in, in portions to come. Yeah, not to get us off on a tangent, also the book of Enoch, I feel the same way. You know, it is quoted uh, in, in, by, by uh, Jude and by Peter and referred to by Yeshua. So if nothing else, these books give us great context into what the people were thinking at that time. And many people, as, as in with Dr. Pigeon's case, will argue they should be scripture or they should be included in the canonized scripture. Sure. And so just to be something that we should you know, look at as we're reading through the, you know, these next couple of verses, uh, verse six talked about an east wind. And so this east wind that we're seeing come in, um, it, it, just to pull it up real quick, it says, and saw seven lean heads scorched by the east wind coming up after them. So east wind is something that's referenced um, a, a number of times throughout scripture, close to 20 different times that is brought up in scripture about this east wind. And what's interesting about it is that this east wind is often connected uh, with destruction and, and judgment from the Most High. And so J.P. McMahon brought this up in, in, a, in a couple years ago, one of his studies uh, through this portion, and it, it caused me to kind of do some some digger, uh, dig deeper into this portion um, and into this east wind and what it was all about. And so just to bring up one in, in, um, in, in the Exodus account, when Moses is uh, bringing them through the Red Sea, it says, Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Mitzrayim, and Yahweh brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. Morning came, and the east wind brought locusts. So this is during the time of the Exodus. Uh, locusts came on the land. And then again, when they're crossing the Red Sea, he brings an east wind, and it parts the sea, and it comes about dry land. And so we're seeing this east wind kind of be judgment uh, that's about to befall. And we see this happening in this dream uh, that is taking place here. What is the judgment going to be on Egypt when this east wind starts to come through? There's a question in the chat real quick. I'm trying to monitor the chat here. Scotty says, could the different interpretations given to the prophetic given be prophetic of many false prophets. Um, 
I think what it is, is it's the prophets of false gods trying to mislead Pharaoh. And so somewhere in there, I believe Yah told, left a, an impression on Pharaoh, this is not the truth. This is not what you want to hear because he's obviously setting the table for his man, Joseph, to come in and, and lay out, lay down what, what the dream is. And, and since we're talking about false prophets real quick, I think it's interesting to note, you know, Deuteronomy 13. So obviously there's different uh, stipulations for what a false prophet mm -hmm. is. And so a false prophet could Great be someone point. that is, is prophesying point. falsely. Uh, they say something is going to happen. Uh, they, they give a prophetic word and it doesn't occur. Well, that's a false prophet because obviously they weren't really seeing the truth. They didn't have true knowledge. But there's another type of false prophet. And it's somebody that does give a, a true prophetic word. What they say does come true. What they say does come to pass. But they deviate slightly from the word of God. They deviate slightly from his Torah, from his instructions, and they bring his people astray. And so, you know, Balaam uh, is an example mm -hmm. of that. And so uh, with that story, how he was prophesying, he was, you know, speaking from the most high, the, the, the words that were being spoken through him, yet he continued to uh, deviate and bring destruction on the house of Israel or on the, the people of Israel. And so where Deuteronomy 13 lies is we need to make sure that um, even though we're seeing signs and miracles and, and Yeshua says the same thing, he says, you know, you many will come to me and say, did we not perform miracles in your name and, and cast out demons in your name? But still I will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you workers of lawlessness, workers of Torahlessness, those who are, are bringing a, a prophetic word yet are deviating from his Torah. Scripture tells us that those are false prophets and they are not operating the way that a prophet of the most high should be operating another important note to the deuteronomy 13 test and uh 119 mysteries did a great video on that a, a couple years ago left a great impression on me is it says that yahweh will bring false prophets to test you and the things they predict will come true however if they lead you away from the torah they are a false prophet and that's why yeshua was a prophet <laughs> likened unto moses moses came to teach the torah and Yeshua was a prophet likened unto Moses that he came to teach the intent of the Torah also. And I think that's why it's so important, and, and not to get off on, on too long of a tangent here, but, you know, when, when people say, well, you know, the church has been operating this way for, for so many years, how can they be wrong? Or, you know, the, the people of God have, you know, been celebrating these days or eating this food or, or observing the Sabbath on this day for so many years, how could that be wrong? And it's, you know, the scriptures tell us that if we are deviating from his word, if we are you know, not obeying his Torah, that that is a sign of a false prophet. And whether or not these prophets know, these people of God know that they are deviating from the word. You know, they, they've been fed these lies, as we see in the book of Jeremiah, that it says that in the in the latter days, they will cry out, we have inherited lies from our fathers. And, that, and that's a time that we're in right now when we have this knowledge, when there's been this, uh, you know, the, the Internet and the, the explosion of, of the word being circulated. People are waking up to the truth and they're realizing lies that they've been inherited no fault of their own. You know, you think think back to, you know, 30, 40 years ago, there wasn't this wealth of knowledge so easily accessible. So what you were being taught by those in, in power and, and those, you know, those who were leading these, uh, you know, churches and congregations were taught that from uh, the pastor before them and the pastor before them to no fault of their own because that was how they were taught to interpret scripture. Yeah, and I think one of the biggest problems I found was I had to wrestle with the fact that I never read the scripture that intently or followed it. I was listening to what someone was telling me all these little snippets were, but we're kind of getting way off the key, off the, the beaten path here. Yeah, so to, to kind of bring us back full circle, what we were talking about was uh, in the book of Jasher, during these dreams, uh, that that the, the, the magicians, the sorcerers, those close uh, to Pharaoh were interpreting his dreams falsely, according to the book of Jasher, and that's why he was so upset because he could not get an answer of what these dreams meant. Uh, could this be why the cupbearer chose to remember Joseph? Um, that is what the book of Jasher would seem to be. It would make sense uh, tying all this in. Um, but let's get back to reading and kind of find out how these, these yeah. dreams shake out. We're actually up to verse 11 at this point. 12, okay. So we'll hop in and we're going to pick up in, in Genesis 41 in verse 12. And there was with us a Hebrew youth, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we related to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. Each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to be as he interpreted for us, so it came to be. He restored me to my office, and he hanged him. And that's what we just discussed. Then Pharaoh sent and called for Yosef, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon, shaved and changed his garments, and came to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Yosef, I have dreamed a dream. 
and there was no one to interpret it. Now, I myself have heard it said that you understand a dream to interpret it. Um, interesting thing here, and I, I kind of I'm stealing this idea from J.P. McMahon at the Way Biblical Fellowship. Here we have Yosef who talked about a dream with his brothers, was stripped and thrown in a pit or a dungeon. Same Hebrew word there's used for dungeon that's used for the, for the pit in, in uh, Genesis 37. Now everything's coming full circle. He's being taken out of the pit. He's putting clothes back on and he's being asked to interpret a dream. And I think what's interesting too, uh, uh, just to note out, it says there was a, there was with us a Hebrew youth. Um, it's interesting that he points out that he was a, a Hebrew youth. Um, I'm not sure if there's, there's, you know, a, a, a deeper a seated reason uh, that he was using that word youth there. If he was trying to maybe cast doubt to Pharaoh, like, oh yeah, there was, you know, there was this guy, um, you know, he, he was interpreting these dreams uh, because he knows that he deliberately did not keep his promise to Joseph. Um, could that be why he was just kind of saying, oh yeah, it was just this, you know, this, this young guy in, in the prison, he, he claimed to know, you know, and be able to interpret dreams. Could that be a, a connection there? Yeah. Sherry asked a question about shaved. Um, I assume, and, and again, this is just my assumption that they had to clean him up a little bit. He had been in prison for quite some time. Uh, so that might be where we're going with that. Also remember the Hebrews had beards and oftentimes long beards. He's pushing 30 years old now. So he has a, probably a fairly long beard. Um, and the Egyptians had much more clean shaven faces. And I, I believe, you know, the Egyptians really didn't like hair. Um, and, and they, they often, you know, often were, were completely shaven. They wore the, the, like the wigs on their head. And, right. and so could that be a connection with that as well? So we'll continue here reading in verse 16. It says, Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. Let Elohim answer Pharaoh with peace. And so it's really awesome how, you know, the first thing Joseph says was, I'm not the one interpreting these dreams. Uh, it, it's the most high God, the God of, of my father, uh, my grandfather, my great grandfather. Uh, he is the one interpreting these dreams. It says, Pharaoh said to Joseph, see in my dream, I stood on the bank of the river and I saw seven cows coming up out of the river, fine looking and fat, and they fed amongst the reeds. And they saw seven other cows coming up after them, poor, very ugly, lean of flesh, such ugliness as I have never seen in all the land of Mitzrayim. And the lean of the flesh and ugly cows ate up the first seven, the fat cows. Yet when they had eaten them up, no one would have known that they had eaten them for they were as ugly as at the beginning. Then I awoke. Also, I looked in my dream and I saw seven heads coming up on one stalk, complete and good. Then saw seven heads withered, lean, scorched by the east wind coming up after them. And the lean heads swallowed up the seven good heads. And I spoke to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. And Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. Elohim has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Okay, and here's an interesting point going back to Jasher. I know everybody in the chat is talking about Jasher. I, I read Jasher a couple of years ago when I bought Rob's book, and I skimmed it again in preparation uh, for today. It talks about Pharaoh sat on a throne of 70 steps, and many of his wise men were mocking this Hebrew youth or 30-year-old youth, as, uh, as uh, Paul said in the chat, because he couldn't... Um, speak any language other than the Hebraic language. I would assume he would speak Egyptian if he had worked in Potiphar's house, but the angel of the Lord came to him and taught him all the languages at once. And Pharaoh would ask a question in a language. And every time you answer that question in that language, you would ascend one of the steps to the top of Pharaoh's throne. And, and Yosef ascended all the way up and told Pharaoh. And that's one of the things that impressed Pharaoh. So it wasn't just that he found they found this guy in jail, shaved him, cleaned him up, put a suit on him and stuck him in front of Pharaoh. It's the idea that there were things built into that that showed Pharaoh that he had a power from God. Now, remember, the Egyptians served many gods. Um, so when he says to Pharaoh here, and, and, and again, I believe I might have heard JP bring this point out, which is awesome. He said Elohim has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do or Elohim interprets the dreams for me. The Egyptians believed in many gods. Elohim is plural for gods, or in, in the case of the Hebrews, it means the all-powerful God. So they may have been talking about two totally different things here. Yosef may have been giving the glory to Elohim, the one true God, the creator of the universe. Pharaoh may have been just thinking, oh, it's just a God. 
right, so this could be a wild tangent that I'm about to go on, but what about the <laughs> the many languages that we see again in, in the New Testament? It acts with the, the, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit allowing this hearing miracle nice of all of these languages. Could this angel of the Lord that came to Joseph, if, if we are to believe Jasher, um, could he have allowed another hearing miracle to take place with Pharaoh um, and, 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 you know, kind of... Yeah. Maybe you should explain him, that because they might him learning these real quick. So you know, with with Acts two, you know what what it was. It says they heard many languages. It wasn't that the people started you know speaking. Uh, it wasn't that all the the apostles were speaking all these languages. Peter was the one speaking at the at the time in Acts two, but it was that everybody was hearing him speak and hearing the apostles speak in their own language. So could it be similar similar to Joseph, where you know he he was taught this in what could he be taught this in one night, or was it a hearing miracle that each time he spoke they were hearing him um, in the language that it was supposed to be? Could could that be how it how it kind of kind of goes there? It, it, just a, an interesting thought I had as we were talking about different languages, hearing miracles, and in, in the spirit of, of God moving through Joseph. Yeah, and, and, and if you haven't heard that interpretation of Acts chapter 2 before, I, I encourage you to read it this Shabbat as you're, as you're, as you're studying. Uh, it's really interesting because they're not saying the people speaking are drunk. They're saying the hearers are drunk. Basically, the people who aren't getting it, who don't have the spirit of the Most High, are saying, what do you mean you're hearing your own language? These people are Hebrews speaking in Hebrew, and you must be drunk because you're thinking you're hearing your own language. And, and it's the way it often is with the ways of Yah is you can tell somebody an interpretation of scripture and they're just blind to the whole thing, blind and deaf in this case. And so, yeah, oftentimes he, he's opening the ears um, and not necessarily, you know, op, you know, changing the tongue to, to what is being said. Um, and so it's, it's always interesting. And again, um, uh, Acts 2 is often talked about uh, speaking in tongues. That's, that's not necessarily what mm -hmm. Acts 2 was about. There is, you know, Paul does talk about speaking in tongues, about a prayer language. But he says that if you're going to be speaking in tongues, there needs to be somebody uh, who interprets it. I, I think we actually did. We, we talked about that quite a bit in, um, in our Shavuot study that we did on, on yeah. NICE TV, yeah. which was our first, our first time on NICE TV, um, which was, was a lot of fun to do and, and talk about with, with Acts 2 and what the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was. But could that be a connection here that we see with Joseph? I'm not sure. It's something we'll have to kind of dig a little deeper and, and, and kind of continue to see as we go on. But we'll, uh, we'll continue studying here and, and get back into the Word. So again, you know, we appreciate the, uh, the comments, the questions, the feedback that are coming from the chat. And uh, we just want to keep this as a an open forum to continue to discuss the word together and, and the reason that we kind of chose this format this is what we do uh, together at, at my house ministries uh, when we, we sit together at, at, in, a, in a house uh, we we sit down we read through the portion and we kind of just let iron sharpen iron and that's the only way really we're, that we're going to be able to learn is when we all come together um, and we function as the body is, is meant to function um, taking the revelation that he gives us and kind of going with it and, and uh, bouncing ideas off each other, getting getting into the word and, and studying together. So uh, we're, we're going to hop in. I believe we're in verse 26 here uh, where he's going to talk about um, what Elohim is about to do um, with these dreams that Pharaoh is having. And the seven good cows are seven years and the seven good heads are seven years. And it is one dream. And the seven lean and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty scort, empty heads scorched by the east wind are seven years of scarcity of food. This is the word which I spoke to Pharaoh. Elohim has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. See, seven years of great plenty are coming in the land of Mitzrayim, but after them, seven years of scarcity of food will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Mitzrayim, and the scarcity of food shall destroy the land. And the plenty shall not be remembered in the land because of the scarcity of food following, for it is very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the word is established by Elohim and Elohim is hastening to do it. I'm wondering if that has to do with any, like two witnesses, it's, mm -hmm. it's just being established twice. So we know the, the, the dream with Peter in Acts 10 happened, you know, three times because Peter wasn't understanding it. So this, this repetition is, seems to be something that the Most High does, number one, to establish his word uh, with two witnesses, uh, two or more witnesses, but uh, also because oftentimes when the Most High speaks, uh, we're too dumb to really understand what, he, what he's trying to say and he needs to let us, he needs to let us know again. 
So it says the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the word is established by God and Elohim is hastening to do it. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Mitzrayim. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint overseers over the land to take up one fifth of the land of Mitzrayim in the seven years of plenty. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. So I love Joseph's humbleness here. He's giving all the credit to Elohim for the interpretation. Then he says, Pharaoh, you need to find a guy that you can put over them. He's not saying, I'm your guy. He's saying, Pharaoh, you need to appoint somebody over this. And, and in the humbleness, Pharaoh says, yeah, I, I think I found him and, and it's going to be you. And so the, the, the humbling thing is what we're seeing when, when our suffering servant, Yeshua, comes. And when he comes in the flesh, the word made flesh, because he continues to do the same thing. It's not my word that I speak, he says. I speak what the Father spoke. It's not my agenda, he says. I come to do the will of the Father again and again and again. He says, this is how you are to pray. Pray, our Father who is in heaven, your will be done. We see the same thing with Joseph here. He's not taking credit. He's not saying, I have this wisdom. I have come to this understanding. He is humble and he is constantly saying, Elohim, the Most High is the one who is allowing this to take place. And the food shall be for a store for the land for the seven years of scarcity of food which shall be in the land of Mitzrayim, and do not let the land be cut off by scarcity of food. And the word was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find another like him, a man in whom has the, whom the spirit of Elohim? Then Pharaoh said to Yosef, Since Elohim has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. Be over my house, you yourself, and at your mouth all my people shall kiss. Only in the throne am I greater than you. So basically what Pharaoh is saying is when you are out, when you are out among the people, you're in command. Only when I'm around am I second. So he's giving him tremendous power over this dream. He's actually putting him in charge of everything. He continues and says, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over the land of Mitzrayim. And Pharaoh took his seal ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. And he dressed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. So that's 42 is an interesting verse because uh, he was stripped of his of his garment. He was he was the, the robe was taken away from him. And then we're also seeing a, a seal ring being placed on his hand. Last week, we talked about the signet ring with Yehuda. So, you know, some, some interesting correlations here with, with verse uh, 42 and how that plays in. Yeah. And just backing up to the chat for a minute, Dreama said something about there was, there was a, uh, in Jasher, Yosef actually appeared before Pharaoh twice. And the first time he said, your wife's about to give birth. And when she does, your other son will, will die. When that happens, Pharaoh calls him back. And that's when he gives him the interpretation of the dream. I kind of didn't go into too much depth on that. Because again, I didn't get a chance. I was traveling all week. Didn't really get to read up on Jasher. But there are some things in Jasher that lead Pharaoh to understand this man has some tremendous power. So back to 42 uh, with, the, with the ring here. We're discussing the ring and, and the garment of, of Joseph. Um, do you see any kind of connection, I guess, with, with him having his garment stolen from him, him going down to the lowest of lows, and then him being restored to power and given this garment again? Is there a significance with this garment? Um, and, and how can we kind of tie this into to our walk today as believers uh, with Revelation being really big about garments, that mm -hmm. being the white, pure garment uh, that we are to put on before we go before the Most High? Any any connections or, or correlations with that? I, I don't know. I, what, yeah. what do you guys think out the there? What, what do you guys say. have to think about the, the garments there? So we'll, we'll continue. It says, and he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had, and they cried out before him, bow the knee, and he sent him over all the land of Mitzrayim. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without a word from you, let no man lift his hand or foot in all the land of Mitzrayim. So he was in the lowest of lows. He was in that dungeon. He was in the pit. I mean, his brother sold him into, into slavery. Uh, he was Then he rose to power in Potiphar's house, brought back down to the, to the low of low again, and now he is second in command in all of Egypt. It's, it's pretty amazing to kind of see uh, where he has been brought to and, and how he has been elevated to this power. And we're, we're going to see um, how this power 
comes to save the people of, of Egypt and comes to save his family, uh, Israel, and allows uh, the, the, the lineage of Israel to be able to continue uh, to the 12 tribes and, and who they are uh, today. So here's the interesting thing. If we have this man, this Hebrew man, who rose to this kind of a power in Egypt, would he be a legend? Would, would the Egyptians know him? Would they talk about him? Would he be part of their history? Now, remember, these events happened 1,900 years before Yeshua, so we're about, what, 3,900 years ago these things were happening, 3,800 years ago or so. So there is a character in Egyptian history, and I'm probably going to butcher the name here. It's Imhotep. And people have argued many times back and forth, was this character Joseph or not? Now, remember, the Egyptians are chronicling their history. They're not going to give credit to a Hebrew as being the person who did all these great things. But this Imhotep character um, actually was, was under a pharaoh. And it talks about during his time, a community of shepherds from the north came and they pastured their cattle in Egypt. It talks about Imhotep being an interpreter of dreams. It talks about all of these things that he had done. Um, there was a great distress on Pharaoh when he came to power. Uh, there was an inscription that there was a famine at the time that he was in power. Um, he interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh. He incorporated a 10% or a one-tenth tax on the people. And we're going to find out later that Joseph brings a tax upon the people of Egypt. He was considered a great builder. Uh, the name Imhotep in Egypt is translated to mean the voice of I am. Um, but there's no record in Egypt of a God, I am. So I would think this could be a perversion of the story of Joseph, but the Egyptians Egyptianized him. They've, they've even tried to make him a God in some of, the, some of their writings. Uh, but there was a character about this time who did some amazing things uh, in the land of Egypt. And you can search for a lot of different sources that say that most people think Joseph was this Egyptian character in Hotep. So Michelle says in the chat that uh, that's the name of the mummy yes. in, the, in the mummy movies, I meant which, to bring is, that which, up. which is very interesting. Um, and Paul Albert says that uh, the, the Amotep virus is uh, going around in the school system that he's working out. So it's interesting some uh, some connections here to Imhotep. But if you were you know the Egyptians and you were writing your history, why would you give your credit uh, to anybody? else outside of you know your lineage or heritage and what they've kind of made this Imhotep to be is is almost this uh you know this this extra worldly you mm -hmm. know person that, that kind of saved them from all this stuff well if if you know some guy came from from a from a far off land and, and he, he rose to the ranks and he had this foreign god that you had never heard of he would seem like this this other slave. this <laughs> other worldly this other worldly person and so it is interesting how this Imhotep character uh, correlates to the, the the story of Joseph in the bible and this god that nobody had ever heard of yet they become saved through the great I am, they become saved into who he is. And, and we see that as we go, you know, fast forward, you know, whether it's 250 years or 400 years, depending on the, depending mm -hmm. on the, the, what you believe in, how long they were in Egypt. Um, the great I am takes a, a great multitude out of Mitzrayim. He takes a great multitude with him that anybody who wanted to call on the name of the most high God could be saved. And so he sets an awesome, awesome precedence, you know, moving forward with how this all continues to come together. And to Michelle's point, if Hollywood's going to try to take that name and, and, and pervert it into something so we won't know what it is or look at it, that kind of makes me think maybe there is some credibility here. Uh, we're going to talk about this later when we get to the Exodus. Uh, there was a group of people called the Hyksos who Egyptian history tells us came in and conquered Egypt and destroyed their army and all this. Well, they're not going to say that a bunch of Hebrew sheep herders who we made slaves came in and destroyed us and left and brought brought the, the kingdom down. So you always have to look at you always have to look at history with a skeptical eye. You always have to see who's writing the history and you always have to look for, for different sources or multiple sources or get the whole story because history is written by the winners. And in this case, the Egyptians would never give that kind of credit to a Hebrew slave. So real quick, just before we get back into the text, uh, Linda Elliott had an interesting comment here. It says, the seal ring, the signet, is also used as a description of the earth that Elohim created. Giving Joseph the signet ring could be a direct correlation to the description of the earth as a signet ring before our creator. So that's a, an wow. interesting parallel there um, and, and kind of you know bring, bringing it you know full circle, if you will, uh, pardon the pun, uh, with, uh, with, with the signet ring. Um, in, in the description of the earth. So a very cool parallel there and, and a, a cool point. 
So we're in verse 45 of, of chapter 41, um, where we're going to pick back up. And, and Pharaoh is uh, having Joseph second in command over all of the land. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zapanath Paniah and gave him as a wife, Asenath. Now I know why you gave me this part. The <laughs> daughter of, of Potiphar, the priest of On. And Yosef went out over the land of Mitzrayim. Now Yosef was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, the sovereign of Mitzrayim. And Yosef went out of the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout the land of Mitzrayim. And in the seven years of plenty, the ground brought forth generously. And he gathered all the food the seven years which were in the land of Mitzrayim. And he laid up the food in the cities. And he laid in every city the food of the field which surrounded them. Now here's an interesting thing. You have to think about this. Uh, Paul just mentioned in the chat, and Zach had said it, and I had said it. They're not going to give credit to a Hebrew. So the first thing you have to do is change his name. And if you look at all of the Hebrews throughout the Bible who served the kings, uh, whether it was Daniel, whether it was Nehemiah, who was a cupbearer to, to, uh, to the king, or Joseph in this case, they change their name. Uh, the, the three young men in the furnace, they change their name. They give them a name uh, that fits in with, with their society and their culture. Uh, interestingly enough, I did a study on this Potiphar, the priest of On. And in my notes I have here, uh, On is not a god of the Egyptians. It's more of a place. Um, and, and there's a scripture that tells us that. And I'm trying to find my notes here. Scroll too far. There we go. I apologize for that. Um, in Ezekiel 30, chapter 7, 18, it says the young men of On and Pishba will die violently in their cities and will be taken captive um, in, 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 in the ISV. In the King James, it says the young men of Avon and Pishba will, will fall by the sword in their cities and go into captive. So it's geographic. This priest is not the priest of of a certain god named on it's the priest of an area a geographic area that most people say was about 20 miles from memphis egypt that's interesting because you always think of the a priest of something priest of a god or priest of, of that god but that, yeah. that is an interesting connection there uh so michelle's making some very interesting uh connections here in the chat she says joseph equals added and then uh zephnath panea uh his cha name change was treasury of the glorious rest salvation rest savior of the age um so michelle i hope you're correct with that uh uh, interpretation of those names there because that's very very interesting how 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 it continues to correlate um, through here and it also what's interesting is how you know when you're taken into the land that the names were changed to uh, names of the land so we see that with uh, Shadrach Meshach and Abednego yeah. with with Daniel um, I, I know you like to always call him Hananiah uh, yeah, Azariah yeah. and then uh, Ishael and, and so it's <laughs> it's funny how um, their their name they're remembered by their their Babylonian names and not, not their Hebrew names but it is interesting how they take on these names of of um, the the land that they're in. Uh, it is kind of kind of interesting how that continues to connect. Yeah, again, that's an Egyptian name, but the the Jewish tradition is it, uh, and I got this actually from Nehemiah Gordon, who's who's a Hebrew scholar. It's not a direct Hebrew translation, but the Jews say that it means one who reveals mysteries was the name that the Pharaoh had given to him. And again, it's you know it's cool to see you know, what names mean, and we're going to kind of tie that in as we continue to go here. And so uh, Jesse Fye had a, a question here, and it says. Um, is it appropriate to equate the Holy Spirit to Torah? And so if, if you go back to the chart that we had in, at, at the very beginning, um, I, I could uh, pull it up at the end. It says, um, when we talked about he, how he made provisions for his brothers in the land, um, I'll show it here real quick. Uh, made provision for his brothers in the land in, in, in Genesis 42. We're going we're gonna to get to that. Um, it says that he, uh, Yeshua, we see, provides the, the spirit of the Most High. And Ezekiel um, in, in, 20, in 3627, sorry, that's a, a typo there. In Ezekiel 3627, it says that he provides his spirit for us to cause us to walk in his ways. Um, so, Jesse, I don't know if it's, it's a direct correlation that the Holy Spirit equals Torah, but the Holy Spirit of God, Teaches the, the Spirit of God allows us to walk in his Torah. And so, you know, when we are walking in his Torah, we, we need to make sure that we're walking in his spirit as well, because you can walk in Torah by the letter of the law, but you're not truly walking in Torah unless you're walking in the spirit as well. And that's why it's, you know, it's so important to, to make that connection because the, the, the Pharisees at the time of Yeshua, 
they knew the Torah inside and out. They had added to the Torah. Now they had elevated their own interpretations, you know, above that, but they still were, were walking by the letter of the law, but they weren't being led by the spirit. And it's the same way. You can say you're being led by the spirit, but if your if your works, if your uh, actions, if your uh, what you are doing does not show that, uh, then it is not necessarily uh, <laughs> showing what spirit you are being led by. There has to be connections um, a, a, as they as they come through there. And so, you know, a very, again, a very interesting question, a very good question, and something that we hope to can kind of continue to see as we dive through these portions here. So I believe um, we are at... at uh, Actually, we're finished 47, we're at 49. So we're going to be starting verse 49 here. Sorry, a lot of discussion tonight. So we'll hop back in. Um, to the portion and continue to read here in, in verse 49. Thus Yosef gathered much grain as the sand of the sea until he ceased counting, for it was without number. And to Yosef were born two sons before the years of scarcity of food came from, from Asnath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On, born to him. And Yosef called the name of his firstborn son Manasseh, for Elohim made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for Elohim caused me to bear fruit in the land of my affliction. So interesting connections here. Um, the first one being uh, he, he gathered uh, as much grain to the sand of the sea. So his uh, great grandfather, Abraham, was promised to have descendants um, as great as the sand of the sea. And so an interesting connection there. And then 51 and 52 with Manasseh and Ephraim. Um, we're going to be seeing a lot of this moving forward in, in you know, some, some very uh, key pivotal points um, coming from the Melo HaGoyim, which is uh, Ephraim. He is going to be the fullness of the nations, uh, which is going to be very, very interesting as, as, we, as we move forward. Which as we are today, as Israel grafted in Israel, we are to bear fruit in the land of our affliction. So there's a lot of talk about we're in Babylon right now. Uh, what can we do in Babylon? How are we bearing fruit? How is, is Yah going to call his people out and fulfill his kingdom? And, and that's where we're at right now with the names of these two sons. Uh, we're, we're going to forget the toil eventually and, and be back in our father's house, but we're also going to bear fruit in the land of our affliction. And remember now, these two boys are half Egyptian. Yeah, that's, that's interesting too. They are half Egyptian. That's something something to remember. So we'll uh, continue here with the 53. It says, The seven years of plenty which were in the land of Mitzrayim came to an end, and the seven years of scarcity of food began to come, as Yosef had said. And the scarcity of food was in all lands, but in all the land of Mitzrayim there was bread. But when all the land of Mitzrayim hungered and the people cried to Pharaoh for bread, Pharaoh said to all the Mitzrites, go to Joseph, do whatever he says to you. So it's amazing that Pharaoh is giving this, this authority and this power uh, to Joseph. It says, and the scarcity of food was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Mitzrites. And the scarcity of food was severe in the land of Mitzrayim. And all the earth came to Joseph and Mitzrayim to buy grain because the scarcity of food was severe in the land. Okay, so we jump to chapter 42. And when Jacob saw that the grain, there was grain in Mitzrayim, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look at each other? Um, yeah, you know, we have to remember that that Abraham had to go to Mitzrayim when there was a scarcity of food. So he's basically saying, you know, why are you just sitting there? Get off your tails and go get something. And he said to them, see, I have heard that there is enough grain in that there is grain in Mitzrayim. Go down to the place and buy for us there and let us live and not die. And Yosef's 10 brothers went down to buy grain in Mitzrayim. But Yaakov did not send Yosef's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, lest some harm come to him. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed for scarcity of food in the land of Canaan. Now, if we talked about this last week, he showed such favoritism to Joseph. Um, here he is again with the other son of Rachel who died giving birth to Benjamin. He won't let the youth go with his brothers uh, because it's the son of his beloved wife. And he doesn't want to, to let him out of his sight. And so he still is struggling with this, you know, kind of favoritism of, of being, you know, 
clinging on to, to Rachel and, and clinging on to, to those who came uh, from Rachel. And, and we know that uh, we talked about, you know, the uh, I think it was two portions ago with Benjamin's name being a change to son of my right hand. So he, he was held uh, to some pretty, pretty high esteem there um, with him there. So we'll continue here as, as we uh, pick up with verse six. It says, Joseph was the governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke to them harshly. And he said to them, where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them and said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. So it's interesting here to back up for a minute. They're standing before their brother who they haven't seen for at least 13 years. He's dressed as an Egyptian. They don't recognize him because he was 17. Now he's a 30 year old man. He's probably has eye makeup. He's shaved. He's wearing the headdress of an Egyptian. They don't think that their brother would ever have risen to the second in command of all of Egypt. So they're totally shocked, totally do not recognize him. And it even says that in, in I believe this is in Jasher also that they spoke, he spoke to them through an interpreter. He didn't even speak their language. And we're going to find out later. They don't realize he speaks their language. So, He's barking these commands and it's probably being interpreted to them. And they need they, that he know he doesn't even show that he knows their native language. And so I think there's one of two ways that we can take what's what's about to happen here in, in the uh, dialogue that they're about to have. Number one, he is is he just being deceptive? Is he just being kind of you know by is he kind of lying, saying that they're spies that they they've come to see the nakedness of the land? Or is he still clinging and, and holding on uh, to this, you know, the, the very last memory he has of them is them stripping him of his coat, throwing him into the pit, leaving him for dead, selling him to the, you know, selling him to the, the, the Midianites. Uh, is he thinking that, okay, they, they've come to play me. They recognize me. They're playing dumb. They're being spies. You know, there's kind of two ways that we can take this. What, what do you kind of see as, as we're going on here? I think the million dollar question is always, as we've been bringing up every week that we've done the Torah portion, we have Rebecca lying and cheating to Isaac to cheat Esau out of a blessing. We have Laban uh, lying and cheating Jacob with his wife and giving him Leah instead of Rachel. And we would not have had the 12 tribes if he had just married Rachel as he wanted to. Um, we have Jacob lying and cheating his father-in-law. We have the brothers doing this to the brothers. And so the answer is always, are they fulfilling Yah's will by violating his Torah? Or when Yah prophesies that something is going to happen, does he know that the deceitful hearts of these people are going to do these things and they're going to come around in the way he's doing it? And, and that's that's the big thing. You know, that's that's my personal opinion of it. I don't believe that. And we talked about this in the chat and this went on in the chat for a while after the issue that we had with Rebecca, Esau and Jacob and the, and the, the cheating of the blessing um, that, that, that she was fulfilling Yah's will and Yah wanted her to do these things and whatnot. I would think that when Yah says something's going to happen, he knows the end from the beginning. But people also pay because Jacob had to toil for Laban to get his wives and Rebecca didn't see her son and she was worried that her one son was going to kill her other son and she was going to lose both sons. Uh, and in this case, you know, Jacob's gone and away from his family and his father's lamenting for him for 13 years, thinking he's dead. So that's the big question. And that's the big take. When these people do these very human things, Yah's plan is being fulfilled. But these people have to suffer the repercussions for their actions, for the things they should not be doing. And, and I think you kind of alluded to this before as, you know, us living in uh slavery us living in captivity like we are now you know a lot of people like to reference that we're living in babylon you know how can we you know uh break away from the system this that and the other well scripture is kind of clear about what we are to do and it's we have to live in captivity until he takes us out of captivity we can't you know take ourselves out of captivity he's going to return he's going to take us out he's going to restore us to the land and uh, so we have you know some some good friends uh up in michigan the taylor family i'm not sure if they're watching tonight or not but we've had a lot of good discussions with them about that same thing you know, we cannot take ourselves uh, out of captivity on our own. You know, we have to wait for him to come and restore all things. He used Joseph in 
Egypt, he allowed him to rise through the ranks as, you know, living as an Egyptian, where, dressing like an Egyptian, walking and talking like an Egyptian. Is there a song like yeah. that? You're, you're a lot older than me. You might know. But, you know, there, there, there was he used him in that land, in slavery, in captivity to bring about his will to let his will be done and to save israel to save the the sons of israel through the famine through the drought uh, which is often correlated to you know drought being not hearing from god not knowing god being far from god and he restores that he restores the the the, the tribes of israel and brings fullness god's plan is done his will is done through this slavery through this treachery through this act and, and Paul and Karen both brought up the, the point that, that, that we were going to make next, and that's that Judah, or in this case, all the tribes, do not see their Savior or their brother coming to save them. Um, but, but it is important to note that in the result of Joseph's actions of doing this to his brothers, we see his brother's hearts, we see repentance, we see his brothers get very scared. And there's the whole story in Jasher, how they're running and hiding and trying to get out of the city and whatnot. Um, but the idea here is whether Joseph is doing this of his own volition, whether he still bears ill will to his, his brothers, or he just wants to see if they've come around, his brothers grow through this baptism of fire or through this, that they're, they're refurbished through this and, and they do come around. So we'll pick up in verse 10 and continue back with uh, Joseph's encounter with his brothers here for the, for the first time and, and uh, what seems to be what, the close to 13 years. So it says, and they said to him, no, my master, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons. We are trustworthy. Your servants are not spies. But he said to him, no, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, your servants are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And see, the youngest is with our father today. And one is no more. And Yosef said to them, it is I. It is as I spoke to you saying, you are spies, but by this, you shall be proven by the life of Pharaoh. You do not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. So that's the amazing part is they, they set this whole thing up by saying our youngest brother's not here and they play right into Joseph's hands. And so it's interesting that he, you know, he wants to bring Benjamin here to, to the land. He wants to, he wants to see Benjamin, uh, uh, be brought to Egypt. And it's, we made the connection, Benjamin being son of my right hand, uh, his son, he says, I called my son out of Egypt. Benjamin wouldn't have gone to Egypt if Joseph didn't, you know, bring him down through the land. So it's kind of, you know, again, how we kind of see how this all tends to come full circle. Interestingly enough, this wording in the Hebrew in, at the end of verse 13, one is no more, shows up actually earlier in the book of Genesis when it talks about Enoch, when it says Enoch walked with God and Enoch was no more. It's the exact same Hebrew phrase that's used here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother while you are kept in prison. So let your words be proven to see whether there is any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, you are spies. And he put them all together in prison for three days. And Yosef said to them on the third day, do this and live for I fear Elohim. If you are trustworthy, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house and you go and bring the grain for the scarcity of food of your houses and bring your youngest brother to me and let your words be confirmed and you do not die. And so they did. So again, we're seeing three days. It's kind of, there's, you know, what's always something is going to continue to happen in scripture after three days. It's, it kind of brings, uh, brings it through here. Uh, could it be the uh, lost tribes of Israel coming out of prison after the three days? <laughs> It's, a, it's amazing how, again, we, we just see everything. Scripture is so cyclical, and it, it all starts to come full circle. Um, as we're going to kind of continue to read through here, it's just amazing, uh, just the, 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 the prophetic nature of, of God's Word as we continue to, to, to deep dig deeper and study into the meaning of these words, how we'll kind of continue to go here. And so uh, Scotty uh, put a comment in the chat. He says, there's a great word study with uh, that, that you may live. Yeah, he says that um, you may live. And so that's, uh, you know, a, again, uh, how, how the, the phrasing of, of the Hebrew as we continue to learn these and, and, and study together with it. So it continues, it says, they said to each other, truly, we are guilty concerning our brother. For we saw the distress of his life when he pleaded with us, yet we did not listen. 
that is why the distress has come upon us. And so they're starting to, you know, argue within each other now and, you know, talk about, uh, they're recalling uh, what they did to Joseph as well. So Reuben, the oldest, answered them saying, did I not speak to you saying, do not sin against the boy? And you did not listen and see his blood is now required of us. And they did not know that Joseph understood them for he spoke to them through an interpreter. And he turned himself away from them and wept, but came back to them and spoke to them. And he took Shimon, Simeon, from them and bound him before their eyes. So it's interesting here, the oldest brother, um, who was the one who wanted to restore him to the father, and we covered this in depth last week, he doesn't grab the oldest brother, but how would this Egyptian guy know to grab the second brother? Yeah. And so, you know, he, he he's kind of forgiving Reuben, uh, if you will. Uh, it kind of seems to be that he said, you know, that he, he sees Reuben's heart at this point. He's saying uh, Reuben seems to be repenting of these actions. So he goes for, uh, as Darren said, the second oldest. Yeah. So Michelle just said, you know, why did Joseph choose Simeon? I think it's because he was second in order and Joseph did not want to imprison Reuben because having overheard the conversation, he knew that Reuben was not in on the plot to do all this to him, that this harm would befall him. And so, it, you know, it, it always, again, is connected to the um, to the inheritance, to the blessings. You know, obviously, the the uh, the oldest brother was in the, the highest esteem. So then he goes kind of down, down the line and, and, and chooses uh, Simeon here. And Yosef commanded that they and they filled their sacks with grain also to put back every man's silver in his sack and give them food for the journey. And thus it was done for them. And they loaded their donkeys with the grain and went from there. And as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his silver, for there it was at the mouth of his sack. And he said to his brothers, my silver has been returned, and there it is in my sack. And their hearts sank, and they were afraid, saying to each other, what is this Elohim has done to us? So here you have this Egyptian guy kept one of their brothers and said, I'm not giving him back until you bring your little brother, the one that the father would not let come on this trip. And they find that the silver's back in their sack. So it could look like they had stolen this grain. Um, and so they're, they're not even blaming the Egyptian guy. They're believing that Elohim is punishing them for what they did to Yosef. So he continues, it says, So they came to Yaakov, their father, in the land of Canaan, and reported to him all that befell them, saying, The man, the master of the land, spoke to us harshly and took us for spies of the land. But we said to him, We are trustworthy. We are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest today, and our father is with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man, the master of the land, said to us, By this I know that you are trustworthy. Leave one of your brothers here with me and take food for the scarcity of food. Take scarcity of food of all your households and go. And bring your youngest brother to me. Then I know that you are not spies, but you are trustworthy. I give your brother to you, and you move about in the land. And it came to be as they emptied their sacks that they took the bundle of each of each man's silver was in his sack. And when they and when they and their father saw the bundles of silver, they were afraid. Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you have taken Benjamin, Benjamin. All this is against me. So Reuben spoke to his father, saying, Take the lives of my, of my two sons. If I do not bring him back to you, put him in my hands. I myself will bring him back to you. But he said, my son is not going down with you, for his brother is dead and he is left alone. If any harm should come to him along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave, to Sheol. So Scotty said it's amazing that they didn't just turn back and it showed the condition of their heart. I think it showed the fear in their hearts because they are afraid of this Egyptian guy who's messing with them at this point. Uh, the, the part that bothers me is the father's writing off Shimon right here. He's like, he's done, he's gone. Now Yosef's gone. Now I lost another son. I'm not giving up a third son. He, The father doesn't even, he wants Benjamin with him so badly, he won't even try to take him back there to rescue his other son. Uh, whereas you would wonder if, even though he's an elderly man, he wouldn't go up here before this man with his two sons and say, and plead for Shimon to be out of prison. He just leaves him there. 
And I, I think, you know, we have to remember this is all this, you know, trial by fire. These are these tribulation moments that we all go through. And, and so God is using this time right now to either bring them, it's going to be a make or break moment for them. They, they are seeing the, and they are understanding uh, that they reap what they sow. And so I, I think this kind of hints to the fact that they knew the Torah, they, they knew the instructions, and they knew what they were violating. They knew that uh, blood was on their hands. They knew what they had done to Joseph in there and finally coming to this reconciliation saying, God is doing this to us. We are seeing the punishment. We're seeing the curses of our actions because that is what Torah is. That is what the instructions of God are. It says, choose this day who you will serve. And then he said, he goes on to say, Moses is telling them, choose blessing so you may live, obey his commands. It will be cursed to you if you choose to disobey. That is what they are seeing, uh, this blessing and curse that comes from obeying the Most High. So we'll hop into uh, chapter 43 uh, as, as they have to go back down into the land. So we'll pick up in verse 1. But the scarcity of food was severe in the land, and it came to be when they had eaten up the grain that they had brought from Mitzrayim, that their father said to them, go back and buy us a little food. And that bothers me. Don't go back and get Simeon. Go back and buy us some food. But Yehuda spoke to him, saying, the man vehemently warned us, saying, you do not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you let our brother go with us, we go down to buy food. But if you do not let him go, we do not go down. Because the man said to us, you do not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Yisrael said, why did you do evil to me and inform the man that you still had another brother? And they said, the man kept asking about us and our relatives saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we informed him according to these words, how could we know that he would say, bring your brother down? So there's, you know, still not making this, they're this lying. Whole connection. They're here. lying because they're the ones that said, we're the sons of 12 sons of, of, of a man and, and, and our, old, our one brother's missing and our youngest brother's still with our father. He didn't keep questioning them and grilling them and finding out about the other brother. So verse seven's a flat out lie to their father. It says, Yehuda said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me and let us arise and go and live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. So Reuben was stepping up and now Judah is, is kind of stepping up here and saying, I will make sure uh, that I take you up, that I will take care of, of, of Benjamin, Benjamin. He says, I myself stand guarantee for him. From my hand, you are to require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not delayed, truly by now, we could have returned the second time. So um, Michelle brought up a great point. She said that he, uh, Jacob would not send Benjamin with Reuben but Israel would send him with Judah. Uh, remember, he 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 has an anger for Reuben uh, because Reuben slept with one of his wives. Yehuda is stepping up here, and, and, and in light of what he did in, in in the last chapter with the Tamar incident in the last Torah portion, Yehuda is now taking control. Yehuda is is is, is standing in the gap for his brother Benjamin. And so we talked about this uh, a couple weeks back when we talked about the name change from Jacob to Israel and how he, he continues to be referenced sometime as Jacob, sometime as Israel. And it seems like he's having these righteous actions when it's when it's referring to Israel. So a really great point, Michelle, um, how that kind of all continues to tie in with who he is. Yisrael is trusting Judah at this point. And so this, this is going to tie into later in the land. It's almost prophetic of what we're going to see when they go into the land and they're given their land allotments. And so this is just a little um, a map that we were able to find with the land allotments. Um, and, and Darren, I don't know if you want to describe about these land allotments at all when, when, when they're given and, and when they go into the land with them. Yeah, the, when he blesses his sons, and I believe it's chapter 49, um, he, he, he talks about, about Reuben going with his, uh, sleeping with his, with his wife. He talks about Simeon and Levi slaying a group of men in their anger. And this was a story we talked about a couple weeks ago in Shechem. Uh, and, and Simeon and Levi really, Simeon gets a land allotment. Levites are the priests that, that, that bears through, but Judah will assimilate Benjamin. And there's a story about Gibeah where almost all the Benjaminites are, are, are destroyed. Um, and so when we talk about the 10 tribes or the lost tribes, Zach circling the area there where Benjamin is uh, just north of Judah. 
Benjamin is assimilated into Judah. So the Jews are really Judah, some Levites that are still living there, and Benjamin who is assimilated in. Uh, so here we have Judah taking care of little brother Benjamin. And even though they were assimilated, they must have still uh, stood out a little Paul. bit because Paul says he was, you know, from the tribe of Benjamin, that he was a Benjaminite. And so King it is Saul also. And so it's interesting, even though they're assimilated, that they still kind of are able to know that. But a, a connection here, the connection that we're trying to make is is the 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 love that Judah says that he will make sure that he will guarantee I myself shall stand guarantee for him. Uh, and then they kind of be, become assimilated into one tribe moving forward. It's, it's just a, an interesting connection. Um, how, how the, the, the two are there, uh, starting from this point on. So the ancestor of Yeshua's earthly lineage is willing to stand in the gap or lay his life down to guarantee his brother's safety. So it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. So we'll continue in 43, it says, Their father, Yisrael, said to them, If so, then do this. Take some of the best fruit of the land in your vessels and bring a present down for the man, a little balm and a little honey, spices, myrrh, nuts, and almonds. So uh, Jacob, uh, when he was you know, kind of in the flesh, he said, Absolutely not. You're not taking Benjamin. You will not do this. And now Yisrael, as he's being referred to here, the, the wisdom of, of God following after God, you know, Yisrael means to uh, strive with God, to wrestle with God, to endure. So he is, he is, you know, following after God's ways now, and he's kind of being wise and having wisdom as you sending him down to the land. It says, take double silver in your hand, take back in your hand, the silver that was returned to the mouth of your sacks. It could have been a mistake. Take your brother, arise, go back to that man. And El Shaddai give to you compassion before the man, so that he shall release your brother Benjamin. And I, if I am bereaved, I am bereaved. And the men took the present and Benjamin, and took and they took double the amount of silver in their hand, arose, went down to Mitzrayim, and stood before Joseph. And Joseph saw Benjamin with him, and he said to the one over his house, Bring the men home and make a great slaughter, and prepare for these men are to eat with me at noon. And the man, the man did as Yosef said, and the man brought the men to Yosef's house, and the men were afraid because they were brought to Yosef's house, and they said, is it because of the silver which was put back in our sacks the first time that we are brought in to throw himself upon us and fall upon us, to take us as slaves, and very importantly, their donkeys also? So they came near the man over the house of Yosef and spoke to him at the door of the house and, and said, Oh, my master, we indeed came down the first time to buy food, but it came to be when we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks and saw that each man's silver in the mouth of his sack, our silver in its weight, and we have brought it back in your hand. Again, this is silver is refinement. This is repentance. This is paying back what they owe. They're not only bringing back more silver, they're bringing back the original silver plus the additional silver. And so Michelle brought up a really good point in the chat, and she said it's quite the present from those who are about to be out of food during a famine. So they're, they're going through this famine. They, they, uh, it makes it you know kind of imply that, uh, that, 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 but they still had all this provision. They still had all of these items, even though the land was in famine. Uh, you know, the most high was still taking care of, of their, their family, it seems. They were wealthy in the sense, but the balm, the honey, and, and the other items couldn't feed their cattle or their sheep. Um, and there was a drought and there was a famine. And, and actually, it even says, and I forgot to bring this up earlier in Jasher, that this was all shortly after Isaac passed away. So after Yitzhak passed away, Yah brought a famine upon the land. And so it is it is interesting how, you know, it, it, it putting us in an agricultural culture you know what was really important was the the, the land you know with their uh, the, the crops their animals etc so we'll continue in 22 it says and we have brought down other silver in our hands to buy food we do not know who put our silver in our sacks so they're bringing back double they're giving back double and then they're still having additional silver to continue to buy food it says, but he said, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your Elohim, the Elohim of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. Your silver had come to me and he brought Simeon out to them. So he's, you know, saying he's kind of, you know, not necessarily lying again, but kind of lying in a sense where he's, you know, saying that they were given this uh, provision from, from God. And what the Genesis account doesn't tell us is how long was Simeon in prison 
and how was he treated in this prison? And I think too, just backtracking for a quick second, um, they have all this silver, they have all these goods, as we talked about bringing these presents, but they don't have, you know, the, the important things. And so we see that at, at the end times, you know, we, we could have all of the, the, the money in the world, but if we don't have, you know, the, what is, the, the true provision, uh, are we going to be equipped? And so we can make that correlation to the, to the oil and, and the light. You know, are we going to be fully equipped with the oil uh, to, to make sure that we have the light to, to endure? Um, the, these guys need to make sure that they are following the lead of their father because he is the one who has that wisdom as they're coming down here and coming in to the land. It says, the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water and they washed their feet and he gave their donkeys fodder. They made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon for they heard that they were to eat there. When Joseph came home, they brought him the present, which was in their hand, and into the house and bowed before him to the earth. Yeah, Michelle brought up an answer to my question. Thank you, Michelle, that Simeon was in prison, according to the book of Jasher, for a year and two months. Um, I like to hang on verse 26 here. Uh, he, they brought the present, and they bowed down to the earth to him. And what was the, the, his, his dream in his youth was that they would all be bowing down to him, that all of his brothers would bow to him. So that prophetic dream came back full circle here as, as we see. And he asked them about their welfare and said, is your father well, the old man whom you spoke of, is he still alive? And they said, your servant, our father is in good health, he is alive. And they bowed their heads down and did obeisance. I believe I said that right. And he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother with whom you have spoken to me? Thirteen years he has not seen his brother. And he said, Elohim show favor to you, my son. And Yosef hurried, for his emotions were deeply moved towards his brothers, and he looked for a place to weep. And he went to his room and wept there, and he washed his face and came out and controlled himself and said, Serve the food. Now remember, uh, the Egyptians wore eye makeup, so we probably had a little bit of a mascara incident going on here. <laughs> It, it, what's kind of cool is that, you know, they were all uh, chastising Joseph when he had these dreams. They were mocking him when he had these dreams. They were, you know, making fun of him, calling him, you know, this this dreamer of dreams, this master of dreams. Yet they do not even realize they're still not making the connection that the dream is coming full circle, that they are bowing down to their brother, uh, the, the, the little runt of the family who is dad's favorite, having these wild uh, dreams. It was true. He, they are, he is saving uh, his brothers in this this uh, time of famine, and they are bowing down to him just as his dream showed. And remember, as we get into the next slide here, they wouldn't. Uh, Egyptian royalty would not eat with these sheep herders from up north. And I, I believe Michelle uh, again tied into Jasher that Joseph uh, that. Joseph invited Benjamin to sit with him. Mm -hmm. um, however, it is interesting that Joseph had still had his own table. The brothers had their table seated in the order of birth, and the servants had their table. So uh, thanks, Michelle, again, for, for adding that in um, as we're going to kind of continue to read through here. And he set them, and he set, and they set him a place by himself and them by themselves and the Miserites who ate with him by themselves, as we just said, for the Miserites could not eat the food with Hebrews, for it was an abomination to the Miserites. And he sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at each other in astonishment. And he took the portions to them from before him. And Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. And they feasted and they drank with him. So they have to be freaked out here because this guy just seated them in order of their birth and gave Benjamin five times more than they had. So they're, you think they're starting to make the connection in their head? You think they're starting to understand what's going on? Or you think that they're just like, wow, this, this guy has knowledge that we have no idea of. I think it just goes to build him up in their minds as this guy that has this incredible freaky ability and, and they're scared to death of them. So that'll put us to chapter 44. It says he commanded the one over his house saying, fill the men's sacks with food as they are able to bear and put each man's silver in the mouth of his sack and put my cup, the silver cup in the mouth of the sack of the youngest and the silver of his grain. And he did according to the word of Joseph, which he spoke. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. 
And when they had gone out of the city, not having gone far, Joseph said to the one over his house, Rise up, follow the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is this not the one from which my master drinks and, and with which he indeed divines? You have done evil in what you have done. So he overtook them and spoke these words to them. So this is a cup of divination or he's telling him it's a cup of divination um, and it's now in Benjamin's sack. So we had this discussion last year um, in our group with this portion. Is this saying that Joseph was, was doing divination or is he kind of just playing the role as an Egyptian, you know, saying that that is, that is, that is what this cup is for and not necessarily that Joseph was, was a diviner. Cause we see in, in Torah that it says that diviners are to be stoned. Divination is, is mm -hmm. very wrong according to the Torah. Um, why, why is that kind of thrown in here with, uh, with that, you know, what are your kind of thoughts and speculation on that? Or is he just using this cup, a divination cup that he did not use to to interpret anything, to keep the allure of him being this Egyptian holy man or this uh, Egyptian official going in the minds of his brothers? Yeah, and so the the, the Hebrew word is uh, nachash for enchanter, diviner. Um, to, to enchant, to practice divination, to divine, to observe science, learn from experience. Um, <clears throat> and so it is, you know, it is the same word, again, that's going to be, be used here uh, later on. Uh, Deuteronomy 18.10 says, There shall be none found among you, any that make his son or daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or, observe, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. It's the same word, uh, nahash, that is used there. So it is interesting that the, the reference... Uh, that, that Joseph is making to the divination again. I would, I, I would think, think so. I would speculate that he was just playing this role. That he was just trying to, you know, masquerade himself as this this guy who who was an Egyptian who was using these Egyptian ways uh, to know his uh, to know the the knowledge of his brothers. Kind of still playing this whole facade, if you will. Well, if you follow to his logical conclusion, Elohim, the one true God in his mind, gave him this this revelation. He would not turn to a pagan cup of divination when he has given all the credit and all the glory to Yah, his God, for teaching him all this. Yeah. So so what do you guys think? What are what are your thoughts? What are your uh, conclusions on, on that matter? So uh, we'll, we'll continue here as we read and, and hope the, the, the comments keep flowing in. So it says, and they said to him, why does my master say these words? Far be it from us that your servant should do according to this word. See, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the silver which we found in the mouth of our sacks. How then should we steal silver or gold from your master's house? Uh, with whomever your servants it is found, he shall die, and we shall become my master's slaves as well. I just realized I'm not screen sharing. I was going to interrupt I'll you, put but that you, up, you were on put a roll. that up for you guys. Sorry about that. Uh, so we're, uh, we are at uh, verse 10. It says, And he said, Now also let it be according to your words. Uh, he with whom it is found becomes my slave, and you are innocent. And they hurried each man, let down his sack to the ground, and each opened his sack. And he searched with the oldest first and with the youngest last, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. So how cyclical is this when we think of his very mother stealing the uh, false gods from her father's house and they're saying whoever has these gods his father says whoever you find these in whoever stolen these will die now we have his mother's son is basically sitting on the false gods it's in a sack but of course Benjamin didn't steal them as 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 uh, Rachel did um, they were they were put in his bag so yeah, it's 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 kind of funny that it's Benjamin, Rachel, Rachel's son, as you said. You know how how awesome is is that connection? Uh, it's it's you know not ironic because nothing in in scripture is ironic, but it's just amazing how again it continues to kind of come come full circle. He was very young when they left Laban. His brother Benjamin was not born yet, but the the comment was meant: whoever you find this on will die. Whoever stolen will die. And obviously Laban never finds out it was Rachel, but Rachel does die soon afterwards. It says, and they tore their garments. Each man loaded his donkey and went back to the city. And Yehuda, his brothers, came to Joseph's house, and he was still there. And they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said to them, what deed is this you have done? Did you not know that a man like me indeed divines? 
And Yehuda said, what do we say to my master? What do we speak or how do we clear ourselves? Elohim has found out the crookedness of your servants. See, we are my master's slaves, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. But he said, far be it from me to do this. The man in whose hand the cup was found, he becomes my slave and you go up in peace to your father. It, it's almost as if he knew that their father said, whatever you do, you must bring back Benjamin. And so here we go again. It says, uh, did you not know that a man like me indeed divines? And, and uh, Paul Albert in the chat, I think, made a very profound statement. He said, Joseph and Daniel both would be very close to the edge of what on the outside appears uh, to be breaking Torah with divination, witchcraft, or sorcery. However, he firmly believes, and I would agree with, with Paul, that all of these activities were were done within what Yahweh the Most High gave them to do. That all of this was taking place through them, and, and Daniel was was one of the you know the, the wise men, uh, if you will, during the time of Babylon. He was head over all all of them, very similar to Joseph um, in Babylon. But I, I firmly believe that what he is doing, he is just. Uh, Putting, putting this whole thought into their heads. Hey, I'm this this Egyptian diviner. I'm you know this 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 mighty man of Egypt uh, to continue this, this act that he is he's putting on them. Yeah, Joseph Joseph gave the credit to Elohim. Daniel was willing to go in a lion's den not to not to violate Torah or to deny his God. So I really think they were both living in a world, um, but they weren't partaking in it to that sense. As Lois said, he was busting their chops. He was uh, yeah. he was just you know playing playing this act, playing this charade uh, for them. So the the, the last uh, kind of kind of section, I think that's the last section here. Um, as we uh, finish up the portion with forty four seventeen, we're left with this cliffhanger of what's going to happen. Uh, what what is you know what is going on with with Benjamin and Joseph? Where are they going to be left off? And it's you know that's where we'll that's kind of leaves us leaves us hanging there uh, for for maquettes this week. And so we'll uh, we'll kind of open up to any other comments, questions uh, that that might be in in the chat before we uh, before we end for the night. But uh, again, we just want to thank everybody uh, for reading along with us. This has just been an awesome way to to study uh, with one another, to really dig into the Word together, and and just to uh, embark on this journey of of a Bible study, if you will, just opening up the Word of God. Uh, scripture says, "Come, let us reason together," says the Most High, and, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to just you know sit together to read and, and to start really uh, just kind of tackling this uh, you know one one verse at a time. Yeah, Dreamer brings up in Jasher. It says that Joseph put a map of stars before Benjamin and said to him, "Read this map and tell me where your brother Joseph is." Uh, and and Benjamin realized he's right there in front of me, and he says, "Don't tell your other brothers yet." Again, varies a little different from the Genesis account. Adds some insight to the Genesis account. So I, I believe Dave's question is, "What is uh, what is the instrument of the stars?" Is that from the from the Jasher account that you're referring to, Dave? Um, I don't believe we read that in in there. Yes, from the Jasher account. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the instrument of uh, of the stars would be. That's a that's a good question. Um, I'd have to have to dig a little bit deeper into that. Um, I don't know if it would have to do with with uh, astronomy or uh, would it get more uh, into you know astrology with the Egyptians. Um, you know, it could kind of run a, a, a number of ways uh, with with that as well. Yeah, quietly, Ryan says, uh, were they afraid to look look Joseph in the eyes because that was a respectful practice, disrespectful practice? And, and Ricky says they would be stoned to death. So again, they're before Egyptian royalty, uh, begging for food basically. So they 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 never even thought it could be their brother and probably weren't looking directly at him. So there's a lot, a lot of good you know comments in there. Could it be the gospel and the stars? Uh, Paul said, you know, the Maseroth stuff is, is possibly uh, instruments of the stars there. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of good stuff in the, in the chat that uh, they seem to be a lot more well-studied than, than we are when it comes to, <laughs> it comes to what, what the instrument of the stars could be. So a lot, a lot of good stuff there. Um, a lot of a lot of really good uh, good information, and and that's what this is. Again, this is meant to be uh, a study 
with the body. And, and so um, I, I've, ref, I've referenced this before, but a body needs to, to work together in tune. It, it, you know, the hand doesn't need to do exactly what the foot does. They have different, uh, they have different functions within the body. And so you know, as we learn to walk with our creator, as the body is meant to walk, he's going to reveal more and more stuff with us. And, and so just like you would, you know, relate that to a, to a marriage, the, the, the closer you walk with your spouse, the more that you're going to understand and, and, and be able to reveal uh, about each other and feel comfortable uh, revealing with each other. And it's the same with the Most High. The you know the, the closer that we walk with Him, He's able to entrust us uh, with more knowledge, with more wisdom. In in you know he, we're we're getting back to, to how it was meant to be in the garden as we walk closer with Him. It says that He walked with Adam and Eve in in the garden. It's just kind of beautiful to see, and and we kind of continue to go. Uh, full, full circle with that. And so um, if there's no other, you know, kind of comments or questions, we'll, we'll probably wrap up um, here tonight. And uh, I'm going to ask Darren, if you want to end us in a word of prayer and we'll, uh, we'll wrap up there with, uh, with, with this week. And so um, again, we, we were reading uh, from the end. Um, this was week 10 of the, the Torah portion cycle. Again, if you, if you, if you're just joining us for the first time, you know, we read the Torah portion um, as a group uh, at, at our local fellowship, My House Ministries. Uh, and, and why the Torah portions are so cool is because everybody around the world is reading uh, this Torah portion at the same time. We're able to discuss uh, with one another what we're learning, what we're finding out uh, this week as, as we read together. And uh, we kind of just called this one Rise to Power, continuing the story of Joseph in Egypt. And uh, and that's where we're we'll tonight. So I'm going to ask uh, I'm gonna ask Darren to wrap us up in a word of prayer, and we'll... Uh, We'll kind of end end tonight uh, end tonight with that. Yeah. Before we go there, the amazing thing about these Torah portions is the first five books of the Bible give us the character and the nature of our of our, of our heavenly Father and our Creator. And until we know His character and nature, how can we fully love Him and worship Him? And so this is why this is so important. So we've been doing the Torah portion now for. A couple of years and when Zach keeps saying our local fellowship, our group and what we do is just sit around. That's actually what we do. We get together on a Saturday. Uh, we, we snack, we eat, we talk, we fellowship. Then we sit down. We put this up on the screen. We read through it. Everybody comments. Everybody brings insight and input, much as we've done tonight in the chat. And that's what we're humbled by is the fact that we're learning from the folks in the chat. Uh, we're not teachers. We're amateurs. We, you know, we have day jobs. I always like to say we just do this uh, because we love scripture and we love to share so we had a fairly large group come start Bible study, probably anywhere from 20 to sometimes up to 40 people and people were missing some of our studies. So genius over here had the bright idea to start recording these things and putting them on YouTube and putting them on Facebook live for the people in our group who missed it. And then things just started snowballing. And that's how we got to do this, but we are not professional teachers. We're not teachers. We're just two guys who love scripture, love to interpret scripture, love to talk about the context of scripture and really love to share with you all and learn what you have out there for us. And it's just awesome to kind of see the body uh, come together a a as it is. And so the, the nice TV family is a, is a wonderful uh, family, a, a lot of different resources uh, that, that John is able to put out there and, and everybody who uh, contributes to, to NICE CTV. Um, so if you ever have any questions, you know, feel free to, you know, contact uh, somebody at NICE CTV, you know, contact somebody in the chat. Uh, this is a, a virtual house church uh, to act as as a body, to act as the called out ones, to act as as a remnant who comes together to uh, to read his to read his word. And, and, and that's just, you know, what the body was always meant to do was to, to help each other out to uh, you know, continue to, to to pray for one another. So, if anybody has any any prayer requests or, or praise reports, please feel free to put them into the chat uh, so that we can continue to pray for the body, uh, pray for one another, uh, and to you know celebrate and, and rejoice in, in praise and in, in the good times as well. Um, so we're, we'll wrap up with a word of prayer, and, and that's where we'll end uh, end this week of uh, Nice TV's Virtual House Church. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we honor your Shabbat, your gift to us, your mark between your people and yourself, uh, we just thank you for the many blessings upon which you've given us, the fellowship, the freedom to share your word, discuss your word, for this medium where we can reach out across the country and all these people can be together to share you. Uh, Lord, we ask you to bless the Now You See TV family, to bless everybody watching this either live or that will watch this in the future. And Father, our prayer is that we all be salt and light and that we further your kingdom, not for our own likelihood, but for your glory. 
Father, I just want to thank you for, for, the, for the body out there, the, the remnant of believers that are waking up to your word. And Father, for those lost sheep that are, are still waiting uh, for their ears to be open, for their eyes to be open, for them to see you for the first time. We just uh, pray that your anointing will go out to them. Uh, we pray that your anointing will fall on us this Sabbath, uh, and you will continue to reveal to us uh, the revelation of your word and the revelation of your word made flesh in Messiah Yeshua, that we would come to a deeper understanding of our relationship with you and with him and how to operate as your body. Uh, Father, we just ask that you would uh, continue to bless us. If there's any healing uh, that is needed uh, out there in the body, we just ask that your healing power would go out. Um, if there is anybody who is uh, hurting or in need, um, whether it be financially or any, uh, any circumstances that need met, Father, we know that you are the great provider. And we just ask uh, that, that we can humble ourselves and that we could uh, come before you uh, and, and lay it all down at your feet. And Father, we just pray to you most high. Amen. Amen. So thank you, everybody, and, and uh, we hope to you know, be able to continue here uh, in, into the future um, and, and study with you as uh, as long as uh, that we'll, we'll be able to here on NICE TV. So uh, with that, we'll we'll wrap up tonight. We love you guys, and we'll see you see you soon. Thanks. All right.